Um, thanks, Crystal, for the introduction, and thank you for Vader for having me here today. Um, how many founders do we have in the room? How many people are starting a company? Me too. What's up, John? So I started working on Practice Fusion in 2002. We had a really good run. We built you know, the largest cloud-based platform for doctors and patients online, raised about $160 million, um, brought it to a 50 million run rate, great valuations. And so what I learned during this process is that you're going to make a lot of really hard decisions. And the reality is, is that you're going to be isolated when you make those decisions. You're going to make those alone. And while you're doing that, you're going to make mistakes. And you'll be accountable for all those mistakes. So nearly near everything I'm going to share are the mistakes I made at Practice Fusion, um, which I'm trying to mitigate my new company, which is really enjoyable so far. The company is called and we'll be announcing it in the next month or so. Um, what I found is other founders have been through the struggle, so very senior people, but usually when they make some of these mistakes, they're not at the company anymore. They get fired. And it's something that either it's uncomfortable for them to talk about or they're simply not allowed to talk about it because they signed a separation agreement or a settlement agreement with their company. So I'm here today to help you to avoid some of the fatal mistakes. I'm also, you know, as a side note, I'm not pitching anything. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to be an advisor or a board member. I'm simply here to be in service to you all. Um, first up, the price of being an entrepreneur. So being a founder is obviously an incred incredibly, incredibly challenging job. Macro concerns are building a great product, hiring people, um, making payroll. The last thing you want to worry about during your tenure, especially if you're in a venture-backed startup, is simply not being there anymore. But the reality is, is that this happens all the time. One of the quotes I stumbled across when I was putting the content together is Sequoia's founder says 45% of their founding CEOs are exited after months of the investment into their company. And so this isn't a binary statistic. This doesn't mean that if you make it past the 18 months, skate free and clear, the pressure will be, will be on your entire tenure. So most people don't know that the founders of Twitter, PayPal, Cisco, and Tesla were all exited. So the original CEOs of the companies and the founders were all exited from the company. Dorsey was fired. He came come back. Peter Thiel was actually fired from PayPal, Cisco, Tesla. It goes on and on. So again, these are going to be some pragmatic steps to protect yourself as you run your new company. So to dig right in, incorporating the company, there are ways you can insulate yourself up front. And one of the ways that I really advocate for is up front advocating and putting in three to four common board seats up front. Now, you don't have to fill them, but you have a placeholder to put other common board members on the board when the time comes. If you wait till your Series A or Series B financing, this is going to be really challenging to negotiate. It's going to be a lot easier if you simply do it up front. Um, it's really, really critical. Maintain control of your company through your board and board structure as long as you can. This is really critical. Many founders lose control of their company after the first round of financing. When we did our Series A to Practice Fusion, we did a great round. The post money was like $20 million. We were really excited about that. I was constantly focused on optimizing for value and not relationship, and that was the wrong thing to do. So after the Series A, it was me, Morgan Thaler was on the board, and an independent. I no longer had control of the company. So it was quite problematic for me, especially because I wasn't aligned with these investors. Um, have a clear vesting schedules for founders and rules for termination. So this is something I see often um, when I started Practice Fusion, but also I see this with a, a lot of companies. Most companies have co-founders, so it's, it's usually multiple founders within the organization. They don't have a clear rules if, um, for example, something I see often is one of the founders will be working part-time or leave the company, and because they didn't define how vesting works or termination, this person leaves with half of the company sometimes. And you're left potentially holding the bag to run the company, and they have all their equity. So that's not fair. So effectively, do this up front. Basically, build out some structure and have that conversation to go, if one of us leaves, what happens? If one of us no longer wants to participate, if one of us is not pulling their weight, how do we break up and how do we divvy up the equity from there? A third thing you can do to insulate yourself is issue class FF shares. So this is a little unorthodox, but class FF shares are founders fund shares, and they're effectively preferred shares for founders. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to not wait five or ten years for the company to sell or IPO, it's in liquidity. It's a mechanic where a part of your shares, which will, the majority of which will be common shares, part of them will now be preferred. And if you do your Series A or Series B investment, you can sell those shares to an investor that's coming in the company without impacting the 409A valuation of the company. Um, longer, deeper, 
more convoluted conversation, but it's a mechanic so you can get some liquidity. It can also protect you in a downside scenario. So if the company, let's say you get to your Series C financing and the company is worth $100 million, but it sells underneath the liquidation preference, if it sells for 20 or $30 million, you'll still get some money on the downside where normally you wouldn't, only the investors would get liquid in that scenario. On the employment agreement front, so startup founders are constantly in a temporary state. They generally never know what's gonna happen next day. So w whether it's payroll or whether it's basically hiring, if the products can be delivered. And when you start, you have nothing. So if you lose it all the first six months or first year, it's kind of inconsequential. It doesn't really matter because you didn't really have a whole lot. But as time goes on, that changes. And after a few rounds of financing, you might wake up and realize, you know, great, you're worth a million, five million, ten million dollars on paper, but if it all ends today, which it can, what do you really tangibly have? Can you even pay your rent? Because a lot of people sacrifice their pay or a salary to hire other people in lieu of equity. So always be thinking about your downside. If this ends today, what do I actually have left? Um, what do I have in my bank account? Can I get liquidity from my equity? Does it actually have any value? And why I say this is that California is completely at will. So effectively, once you incorporate, it doesn't matter if you're the founder of the company, the face of the company, the spokesperson of the company, you are an at will employee. And if the board of co-founders have leverage, they have more votes than you do and they want you gone, they don't need, need a reason to exit you. They can simply do it without cause and without a dialogue uh, up front. So again, back to my earlier point, try to maintain control of the board if you can. Now, this leads us to the employment agreement. So keep in mind your tenure at the company, if you're really building a company, it will be longer than most of your personal relationships. My tenure at Practice Fusion was longer than every adult relationship I had. Uh, I had like dating a person, right? So therefore, you wanna think of your employment agreement much like a prenup. And what, it's what happens to you if you and the company break up, right? So you can do that up front. Key items you want are a great employment attorney, so you want one unassociated with the company. This is another mistake I made. I went through and we updated my employment agreement. I used the company's outside counsel, Wilson Sincini. He worked for the company, so he was incentivized to help me maximize value and protect, protect me. So when I left practice fusion, candidly, I didn't get a whole lot. Um, secondly, so if you need an attorney, let me know. I know a number of outside employment attorneys that are incredibly reasonably priced. Should be a grand or two, but it's something you want to do um, as soon as possible to make sure that you're protected. Within the agreement, one thing to keep in mind is there's something called a care provision, which is quite standard for professional CEOs. And this means if the board fires you, they have to inform you of the issue ahead of time. So for example, 30 days ahead of time, and it gives you time to mitigate the issue to go resolve it. Now, more times than not, if you're really in a rut, you're likely not gonna be able to fix that issue. But it forces them to be professionals and to manage you with you know, your dignity and effectively give you notice so you can leave the company in a clean way and come up with a way that you can still participate if you want, but you can basically tie things with a bow and leave on your terms if that's the case. Thirdly, on the severance side, if you've closed a Series A financing, you should be definitively be getting a, a severance. I, I know a lot of founders that have hit this milestone and for some reason they don't want to take money from the company because the money, even though the company's closed their Series A, they're still a little bit cash strapped. But the net is, is that this is a time to be thinking about yourself. So effectively, you should be somewhere, if you're post Series A, like a six month cash severance is not uh, unreasonable. I'm on a few boards and this is something that we do to be fair to the CEOs. You want to look out for what's best for you. Again, you want to be able to feed yourself. So secondly, equity, you know, if the Sequoia example happens, if you, if you take on financing and months later you're getting fired from the position, you should get some equity for founding the company, some accelerated vesting. Six to 12 months is not unreasonable. And then thirdly, something that I see perpetually missed by a lot of founders, if you're using Wilson Sonsini or Auric or DLA Piper, when they put your stock purchase agreement together for the company, the way the company manages its stock plan, when you leave the company, it will generally state you have 90 days to exercise your options, right? So if your options are priced out at a buck, and you have 100,000 of them, you're gonna owe the company 100 grand. The other problem though, if the market value, the 409A is much higher, let's say the stock's worth 10 bucks a share, you're really excited, you need to pay the gain on that and your taxes that year. 
So when you leave the company, you're gonna get hit with the exercise within 90 days, as well as a, a large six-figure tax bill, and I've seen this happen many times. So the cash expenditure is one problem. The bigger problem, though, is the, the company fails. You don't get that money back for paying for the options, nor do you get the money you paid into the IRS back. So an extended exercise will allow you, let's say it's five years, which is not unreasonable, allow you to take a step back and go, I'm gonna exercise these when it, everything looks good, when the company's performing, there's a market to sell them, and I can get my money in and out and pay my tax bill with it. So it's an incredibly uh, important mechanic. I know a founder recently that was fired. He owned a ton of his company, uh, $700 million valuation. He couldn't afford to exercise his shares. He, lost, he left all of his equity on the table. So really, really painful. So up front, yeah, so this only this is a great point. This only, if you get shares up front, if you're a true founder, your share price is gonna be a fraction of a penny and do that. But the reality is, is that what's gonna happen, um, I was at practice usually for almost 10 years, so I was fully vested. The board came to me, wanted me to still run the company in 2012, around there, and so they gave me another large, large piece of the company. And, exactly, so you're gonna get options as time goes on if you're successful. And this goes for any employee, is the reality. Um, I consistently see that founders don't look out for their best interest. I believe that this is because they're simply naive, unaware, or overloaded. Um, everyone you're engaging with, so keep this in mind. This, it's funny, I, I presented this content recently, and one or two of the seasoned entrepreneurs in the room said that some of this content would break their social contract with their venture investor, which was really interesting to me. But the reality is, is that everyone you're engaging with is looking out for their best interest. Your investors will have preferences on their shares, and then in their agreements, in their investment agreements, they'll have rights. Right? So that's basically kind of their employment agreement. All your executives, any sophisticated executive that comes, to, your, comes to, your, to work for you, that's a VP or above, is gonna have a change in control agreement clause in, within the agreement. They're gonna have a severance as well. So anyone that's, you know, that's done it before will have this. You're the only person that's looking out for yourself. No one else is gonna serve this for you, and no one else is gonna go, we should put this in your agreement. So it's one of those things that comes with success. Um, lastly, you might get along with your board and co-founders now and trust that they might do the right thing when the time comes, but when things go sideways, people tend to show their ugly sides, especially when there's a lot of money involved, and if your company is successful, that's usually when this happens. If you're failing, N none of your, your board's probably not gonna care that much to go to make these things happen. Um, it's usually when you're very, very successful and there's a lot of money on the table. So, you know, again, be, be sure to protect yourself. A great time to tackle this is, is in between the, rather, the, a great time to tackle the employment agreement is probably post-incorporation around the time you're starting to do a Series A or Series B financing. You know, For the company or for the individual? Mainly for the company, but, yep. you know, but, but also, um, you know, an individual, you're right, they need to get an attorney, but also probably a good SEC attorney. Yep. Because, you know, I, the, this uh, is more founder-centric, but I, I hear you, loud and clear. But even, even investment banking, we do with startup companies. We're yep. not the, you know, we're at the 200 companies that we do the three to five million funds. Yep. So we always bring one in, you know, pretty soon right afterwards. Yep, good point, great point. Actually, it's, that was a slide that was in here the last time I presented, it's not now. So um, definitely can have that conversation offline. Um, so another thing I think about often is your three teams. So you should constantly be working to build and develop three teams around you. One is obviously your management team. So think about your chief financial officer, head of marketing, all the obvious stuff to build your business and build value. Secondly, your board team. So board members that you recruit for common seats, you should be super strategic about this as well as board members that come with an investment. And then the third team is your personal support team. So think about coaches, assistants, behavioral therapists. People spend a ton of time on the first one because they're building their company. I see people spend very little time on building out their board in a strategic way, very little time. And I see people spend nearly no time on building out their personal support team to make sure that they can maintain their level of success. So just diving into these, you know, one thing I made a major mistake on is not hiring senior enough, and I constantly see that many founders are intimidated by hiring someone that's more senior than themselves, which ultimately slows them down. 
And in the early days of practice shooting, I was probably at director level, and I would not hire like VPs or super senior leaders and, because I was insecure. And when I got past this block, when I started hiring these people, I, show, I saw a tectonic shift in the organization. It was really powerful. Great leaders will be force multipliers for the following reasons. First and foremost, when you hire, your time will be greatly freed up, especially if you're managing that. So last year, we hired a chief marketing officer at Practice Fusion. I was managing the team just by way of him coming on and doing the job correctly. It allowed me to take a step back and be much more strategic about the business. Secondly, the new leader is going to have a network. If they truly are operating at the level you need, they're going to have a network of people that can come in, that you can hire. They'll accelerate hiring. They'll, the people they'll bring on will be more skilled. And if they're a great leader, their pre prior teams will want to come work with them as well. Um, thirdly, pointing out the obvious, sorry, I'm one bullet off. The new leader should be better at the function than you are. And so effectively, they're going to deliver better value, better results, and when you take a step back, the organization will literally be worth more. A great marketer will you know, be a major inflection point on your growth, and then the company will be worth more, and if you own a significant slug of the company, you will too, which is really invigorating. Now on the flip, choosing the wrong leader can set your company back easily by a year, and I really encourage people to take you know, notice of this and really pay attention. The wrong sales leader, for example, let's take that for example, it probably takes three to six months to hire a great sales leader, and that's being really, really fair. I've taken much longer to find very specific, so I've seen searches. Our CFO search took a full year to the day, so sometimes it can take that long to source someone that's very particular to, to meet your needs. Um, so it can take you know, three to six months, a few months to, to hire them, a few months to get them up to speed, and then if they're off track, generally their entire team's off track, and for sales, you're probably off your sales numbers. So how does this destroy value? If you were supposed to hit $10 million in revenue this year, but you're tracking for eight, you already have a problem there, right? But also, if you were supposed to hit 12 or 14 next year, you're likely not going to make up that delta that you missed in the current year. So that loss, that miss, is going to perpetually haunt you forever. You're never going to make it up. It's going to compound that loss. If you need sales to hit payroll, you're probably not going to hit your payroll. If you're in a good position, a decent one, since you just missed your goal, you're going to have to go to your investors and be super excited. But if they do put money in, you're going to see more dilution. You'll own less of the company. And then the problem I talked about earlier, maintaining control of the company, that new investment's likely going to come with another board seat. So one person can destroy a lot of value in a company. Enough leaders pointing out the obvious will cause the company to fail in its entirety. Um, as a CEO, it can be the reason that you get fired, right? If the company's sales aren't performing and you committed to it, uh, the buck stops with you. You know, as a side note, the wrong leader can ruin culture, cause dysfunction, fighting. People will quit. Sometimes people won't even know why they quit. They just don't like coming to work anymore. Some people will go, he or she's an asshole, but some people just, it's a hostile place or it's not a friendly place or it's not a culture that um, supports them. And so the wrong leader can you know, really, really cause a lot of pain and, and uh, other value loss that's not as measurable. Always have a low tolerance for underperformers. Um, it's happening, you know, have the courage to have the conversation and let them go. So cultural, cultural misfits, um, you know, exit them as soon as possible. One of our monitors at Practice Fusion was hire slow, fire fast. I really encourage people to, to um, you know, uh, abide, but just really follow that. As a side note, the wrong leader beyond value destroyed in the organization can be really expensive. So if you're at scale, let's say you've done your Series B or Series B, between salary and severance, you're probably looking at a half million dollars to get rid of a person. You know, so they were there for six months or a year, you burned through that cash, they didn't deliver any value, plus to get rid of someone, you don't want to litigate, you cut three, six months of severance. All these things are expensive. So you know, half a million dollars to exit when you're at scale is not unreasonable. I've seen exit packages that are much more expensive than this. Secondly, executives, a senior executive is probably getting one or two points at the company if you're between like an A and Series D. So they're going to take that equity with them. So they might have half point during the time they're there, not delivering value for your business. Super painful to watch as well. Um, plus, again, the company is going to be behind in the function that I just described that the leader owned. On the interviewing front, so pointing out the obvious, your ability to assess a candidate in the limited time during an interview is obviously really critical. 
to eliminate the risks that I mentioned. A couple of things I've learned over time, group interviews, in my opinion, are super key. So if you have a one-on-one -on -one interview and the individual goes and meets four other people in the organization, they're gonna do greetings, what's your background, et cetera. Half of the time is gonna be spent in churn, questions that have already been covered. In a group interview, you can do three or four hours, you do the salutations and you do the background once and then you can get really, really deep into a problem set. Um, more efficient, much more depth in the group setting, Plus, this, the team will have the same data. When you walk out of the room, you usually have consensus, which makes the process much, much faster. A great candidate should be able to explain every part of how a particular problem was solved. They should be able to deconstruct it. This is one of Elon Musk's litmus tests. So they should be able to go down, again, to a very granular level and tell you how they solved that particular problem. One thing we learned over time at Practice Fusion, is, and it took a lot of discipline to do this, is we tested everyone. So in the early days, developers would come, we'd give them a chunk of code, and we'd have them work on the, on the problem, and we could objectively look at that code and see if they were, were skilled or not. PR people, you know, a communications person, we'd have come in and we'd have them write a press release. So they'd spend a half day on site, they'd learn about something we were launching soon, and then they would then pitch that to us as well. So again, you see the entire skill set, you know what you're getting. For some reason with executives, if someone had Google or Microsoft on their resume, we would put them on a pedestal and we'd get like shiny penny syndrome with them. And towards the end of my tenure, we got really good at going up front. Hey John, we need you to come in for a couple of days and work with us. So would you be open to doing a working session? And it's interesting, I think a lot of people were afraid to ask this, but for the individual coming in, if they resisted a little bit, you can go, look, you're taking a huge leap to come with us, you're leaving your company, you're going to be a secure position now, et cetera. You don't know us, so this will allow you to get really comfortable with us, and we could be total assholes. You might not want to work with us. And what we found is anyone coming on board was probably just as nervous or anxious as we were to work with them, and this would de-risk them. <coughs> and we had them do actual work. So we found over time, as we dialed this in, people would come and present, and we'd be like, holy shit, you're brilliant, this looks great. And after a few weeks, we go, it's really obvious the content that person presented isn't their actual work. So we actually would have a leader come in for a day, see the problem space, talk to a, to a team, and then they come back a week or two later, whenever they wanted to, and present how they'd fix it. Didn't have to be right, it just, you learn their working style, temperament, if you like them, and um, it, it de-risked the hire significantly, especially for the risk I mentioned on the prior slide, the half a million dollars with cash and severance, the missing your goal, so you want to de-risk these things, and here are some decent ways to do that. Um, Next, obviously check references, but never ever check a reference a candidate gave you. Um, it's a waste of time. I mean, who, who's ever given a bad reference, right? So what you want to do is you want to have your recruiter yourself actually go do the work. Hop on LinkedIn, find people they worked for before, or find people they work, that's, that have worked with them, and just do the work, especially for a senior exec. You want to do an inside track and backgrounding. If you have, you know, if you have venture cash in your company, Leverage the partners and their network to get to people that have worked with the individual you're looking to hire. And lastly, just to repeat the earlier point, they have to be a culture fit. The reality is you're gonna spend more time with them. You're gonna spend more time with them in the process. So they have to fit into the team. You have to let them. Um, tolerating assholes will simply ruin your culture over time. Again, people will quit. So the flip of that is that culture fits will be there longer it will cause other people to be there longer too. I enjoy working with you. I want to come in every day, that's invigorating. And if I'm interviewing and everyone's really cool and exceptional and very bright, I'm gonna to want to be there too. So exceptional human beings attract exceptional human beings. Next up, your board team. So the single biggest mistake I made in forming Practice Fusion was in the composition of my board. As I mentioned earlier on, I highly recommend three to four board common seats up front as placeholders to protect your interest. Um, so again, they can protect your interest, they can be counsel to you. They can also help balance out that board members, and that can happen when you bring on a venture board member, for example. I lost control of practice fusion, as I mentioned, after the first round, just a very, very stupid mistake. The board's primary function, bar none, is hiring and firing the CEO. They're not operators. So when you think about this, if their role is to hire and fire you, you want to spend more time on vetting them than anyone else you spend time with. You're hiring a boss. So once a board member's on board, keep in mind it's nearly impossible to get rid of them. It's like going to Vegas, getting married, never ever being able to get divorced. It's really, really painful. And I've ground through it before. I've gotten someone off my board. It was an insanely painful process because on the venture side, they don't want to leave because they're, they're 
um, the way their incentives are aligned is if to be aligned with you and tied to you and successful with you. So they don't want to leave, and it's understandable. So it's really, really painful. Um, another thing, you know, I, I, I'm really polarizing. You know, uh, I have a pretty polarizing opinion on boards in general. I, I tend to really want to avoid bloated boards. It allows you to run your company in a much more efficient way. I see this all the time. I know the seed company and seed stage company in San Francisco that literally has four or five people on their board. It's silly. So why give up control? Why have four or five bosses? Um, she's so early on, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, if you really want them, so a lot of times I see junior entrepreneurs go, I want to put them on their board because they're great. Just make them an advisor. Pay them the same amount of equity. And, and most people, I would rather be an advisor for you than be on your board because being on your board carries a whole bunch of risk for me. I have to have DNO insurance and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and then lastly, you know, don't add board members unless you really, really have to. Again, board's roles, hiring and firing the CEO, so why freeze the risk? Um, it can create a lot of overhead for you, and as you get larger, you'll see that ramping up for a board meeting takes at least a week. It's super painful. The more board members you have, the more requests they'll have. Your management team will get bogged down. If you're doing meetings every other month, it's um, really, really painful. So again, maintain control of your board. Now, just to segue for a second, there's different types of, of board members, and, and I think that you know, uh, investor board members can be some of the most challenging because it's people that are placed on your board that don't really have to leave. So over time, what you generally see is that the majority of your board members will come from investments. When you do your Series A, B, C, D, you'll probably have four board members at least from that, and so there's more overhead to manage. And what I noticed, we were pitching Sequoia years ago, and during the process, we went in, had a meeting for an hour, second meeting for an hour, third meeting for an hour. They asked all the questions. We literally didn't ask one question. And they gave us a term sheet, and they're like, John's coming on your board. And we we're like, gosh, I don't, I've never even spoken to this guy. So how do I know if I'm aligned with them? How does this process work? So you know, empower yourself. During the first or second interview, probably the second is more appropriate when you're seeing some interest. Go, who in the room is going to likely be the board member here? Spend some time with them, at least three meetings, get comfortable with them, and be transparent. Have some stature. Ask them the last time that when they fired a CEO was. Ask them why. So go through that process. Put them on the spot. Explain what your expectations are of a board member. Your job is to manage that board. Have that conversation up front. And then explain how you run your board meetings. Don't wait for your board to tell you how to run the meeting. That, that means you're on your heels. You're not doing your job. Um, lastly, they're, you're, you're going to be partners with them. They're cutting a big chunk of the fund to you, right? A lot of money. So ask them what they need for the partnership as well. Um, secondly, dial in your EQ. So watch for subtle dysfunctional ba behaviors. I, I think that the Valley is full of like very quant-based data-driven people, and that's fine and dandy. But you know, value your EQ. Value that, that feeling, that pit in your stomach when you meet someone. Look for people with bad handshakes, people that talk too fast, besides me. <laughs> we're, we're, we're done? Okay, great. <laughs> um, my favorite story is um, the first time I met one of my investors, my team was with them, or were with me, and we went to shake their hand, and they bumped. They don't shake hands. They were a germphobe. And so, you know, I'm smart enough to know that's a pretty so uh, I maximized at the time, I had my own insecurities and I wanted a great valuation. And so I was like, I can take bullet and deal with this person. And I did at the cost of my own wellness to deal with their stress and anxiety. But imagine when you're having a board meeting with this person who won't touch other people and your financials are off by 10%, how that person reacts. You guys ever seen The Exorcist when Linda Blair's head spins around and like that green pea soup comes out? Um, so, you know, dial in your EQ, it's something that, um, that we all have and we need to pay more attention to. Um, references as well, so call CEOs in their portfolios, obviously not references they gave you. Check the funded, great resource to get some context there as well. And then, are we done after this? Uh, when you are. <laughs> <laughs> is, this a, is this a hard stop, no questions? Got it, okay. So why don't I just bang through this one last slide. So a couple other things I've learned over the time, board member pitfalls. Um, I generally try to choose operators over MBAs. So you want someone that's actually been in the trenches, can empathize with you and give you context. You don't want an analyst from P and, uh, you know, uh, Procter and Gamble. Um, secondly, I generally try to choose 
Builder Associates when I can, um, when you have the optionality. So junior associates are going to be under a ton of pressure to perform. Um, they're not going to have significant experience to look upon if you hit a roadblock. A partner is going to have more stature, more experience. If you hit a roadblock, and we're usually going to your venture capitalists, if you hit a roadblock because you need more cash, a partner can usually get it done more quickly because they'll have more clout within the uh, fund. Um, and then, you know, my general favorite is a partner who was an operator is generally the best combination. Secondly, don't be rushed into bringing a board member on ever, especially outside of a financing, so if you don't have to. Never, ever bring on someone that you haven't worked with. My single, single, single biggest mistake. Um, and have the person, again, serve on your advisory board first. Get to know them for six or 12 months. Compensate them. Build trust. Once you build trust, put them on your board. You should never be in a rush to bring on a board member, with the exception of a financing when you have to at closing. Um, lastly, I'll just leave it on this note. In, from my experience, board observers are generally a pain in the ass. Um, not everyone them. The net is a lot of funds will go, well, we'll just be an observer. What the, the reality is is that anyone in the room at your board meeting will be a distraction. Um, my last board observer, we only had one at practice fusion, he asked more questions than the rest of the board combined. Super, super painful guy to deal with. And then he had undue influence in the room. He talked more than anyone. He would basically sway public opinion. So it was really, really painful. Um, one of my professional coaches, Bill Campbell, who I'm guessing some of you guys know, one of his quotes was, no one ever said build a larger board. No one's ever said that. Smaller boards are more efficient and much, much more effective in serving you. And so with that.